Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nathan Dorr, and I'm the curator here at the Draper Natural History Museum at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. Uh, on behalf of myself, the Draper, the Center, as well as the Matitsi Museums, it's our pleasure to welcome you to this panel and for me to introduce uh, our moderator today, Dr. Lennox Baker. Lennox, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, appreciate it. As many of you all know, black-footed ferrets are one of the most endangered mammals in North America and have been federally foot protected under the Endangered Species Act in 1967. Uh, several times during the 70s, they were thought to be on the edge of extinction with the last known live one seen in 1979. And then in, eight, in 1981, here in Matitsi, Wyoming, a, 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 Dead ferret was discovered by a ranch dog out on the hog ranch. Uh, people came out from all different areas to start finding them. Denny Hammer and his associate were actually the ones that found the first live one up on the Pitchfork Ranch in 1981. And 70 to 80 ferrets were, were discovered. But over the next four years of observ observations, the count was going down significantly both due to plague and the prairie dogs and also some distemper. So by the mid 1980s, they were getting to be hard to find any of them. And Dr. Thorne, his wife, Dr. Williams, two veterinarians, decided to take the brave step of trying to capture the ones that were there and see if they could breed them. It, they had never been bred in captivity before. They were successful in capturing 18 ferrets and brought them down the Shirley Basin and actually were able to breed seven of these ferrets, uh, became pregnant. Uh, how, many, how many fathers were involved? We're not sure, but Scarface seemed to be the main progenitor of that group. But it's obviously uh, created somewhat of a genetic bottleneck, having uh, one or two uh, genetic lines. Over the last 40 years, U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and many partners have been working towards establishing populations to reduce it, put back in the wild, and uh, hopefully to be able to delist them. But with each passing year, there's a challenge of losing more and more genetic diversity, and since no other population had ever been found. In 2016, a group of partners, Revive and Restore, San Diego Global Frozen Zoo, and Viopen Pets and Equine joined the Fish and Wildlife Service to pursue the idea of cloning the black-footed ferret using DNA material which had been stored since 1987. And uh, permits for the cloning work were granted and the work began. In 2020, the first endangered North American native species was cloned. And on December 10th, black-footed ferret clone Elizabeth Ann was born at the National Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center. Today, we have all the partners involved in this monumental conservation work with us. And it's a success story to tell you about their challenges and successes in the cloning project and the future of the Black-Footed Ferret. So it's a pleasure today to introduce you to Ollie Ryder, who is the Kleberg Endowed Director of Conservation Genetics at the San Diego Zoo, Wildlife Alliance, and Frozen Zoo. Also, we have Ryan Phelan, who's the executive director and co-founder of Revive and Restore. Sean Walker is our chief science officer at Biogen Pets and, Equ and Equine. And Robin Bortner is the black-footed ferret captive breeding manager at the Fish and Wildlife Service National uh, Conservation Center. The, uh, and Angie Bruce is with us, who's the, direct direct, the deputy director of Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And uh, so I would like each of these participants to give us a two minute introduction to their work and then we'll start having some 15 minute presentations. And uh, Ali, want to, want to tell us uh, two minutes on this? Thank you, Dr. Lennox. Um, and um, I really appreciate the invitation. Thanks to you. Thanks to the Durr Museum and to uh, the, sorry, the uh, Nathan Durr at the Draper Museum. And um, hello to everybody uh, in Matitsi. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, 
say more when we get to the questions and answers, but um, this is what the facility that uh, the cells of uh, Elizabeth Ann lived in for decades. Um, we call it the frozen zoo. Uh, cells are maintained in liquid nitrogen. And um, we have uh, a collection that includes many endangered species, um, but the black-footed ferret is one of the first ones that was uh, cloned. And uh, we're very pleased to be involved in this, in this partnership um, and alliance. You might be interested to say, well, how do you establish a cell culture? How did that happen? It actually happened from a black-footed ferret. Elizabeth Ann is a clone of a female named Willa. And Willa uh, died um, without having any surviving offspring. And after her death, a small piece of skin was taken from her body and um, sent to our laboratory. There it was uh, minced um, into small pieces and um, made into a cell suspension by digesting it with an enzyme, not so much different from meat tenderizer, um, and then put into plastic flasks where, in which the cells sit down and grow. And we're fortunate that the cells from Willa grew and were frozen in uh, 1987. Um, where they sat until they were thawed years later uh, to become uh, the animal that we've uh, talked about. The frozen zoo has uh, a lot of stuff in it. Um, it's got over, uh, over 1,100 species and subspecies of skin cells. It's got sperm and semen samples, and um, it, it it, it's got... Um, uh, um, uh, over 600 endangered species uh, in it. So it's, it's gonna be able to be used for other examples. And this, uh, exam this demonstration with Willa is gonna set the stage for, I think, um, more exciting events in the future. Thank you. Very good. What well, an exciting introduction. And uh, Ryan Phelan of Revive and Restore. Um, good morning. I'm Ryan Phelan, and it's really a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to just share just two slides this morning. <laughs> Play. Sorry about that. Um, I'm a co-founder of Revive and Restore. Our mission has been to enhance biodiversity through the genetic rescue of endangered and extinct species. And to be quite honest, the black-footed ferret has been a cornerstone of all of our work over the last eight years. We also work in helping understand the genetics of coral and why coral is bleaching and how to bring back coral to stand climate change. And we're working on extinct species like the passenger pigeon. We are building what we call the Genetic Rescue Toolkit trying to help conservation utilize all the tools of 21st century medicine. And that starts fundamentally with biobanking and sequencing. And it goes on to include the cellular stem cell development, cell culture development that Oliver Ryder just referred to. And in the heart of all of this is advanced reproductive technologies. And that is the intro to cloning, which you're gonna hear a lot about today. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to our next speaker. Sean Walker with Biogen. Can you help me stop share? There we go. Okay, is all good here? Um, yep. uh, just want to say thanks to everybody for allowing us to be part of this project and also to be part of this uh, webinar today. Um, my name is Sean Walker. I am the Chief Scientific Officer of Biogen Pets and Equine. Uh, we are a cloning company and have been cloning uh, to various species for the past 20 years. Uh, we are very excited about being part of this project and actually being able to give back to conservation. Um, you know, we're, we're just, we're just uh, ecstatic just the way everything has turned out and we look forward to the future. And so I, my, mine is a little bit less than two minutes, but thanks everyone for um, being here for the webinar and actually allowing us to be part of the um, project. Great. And Robin Bortner from the, from the center.
Okay, thank you, Liz. Sorry, <clears throat> mute button. Um, yes, my name is Robin Bordner. I am a fish and wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service. Uh, my main role has, is the captive breeding manager here at the center. Um, this is the center down here. Um, we're out here on the prairie um, in northern Colorado. Um, I oversee our um, main breeding colony here and help with all operations of breeding and caring for black-footed ferrets throughout the year and help including with transfers. <clears throat> and what that has meant for our cloning program here um, means that I have been helping looking after um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Ann, uh, the first clone black-footed ferret of which you're going to hear much about today. Um, I have uh, overseen the team that has been uh, the primary uh, caregivers for her since uh, she has come into our world. Um, she lives here with the rest of our uh, Black-footed ferret colony <clears throat> uh, that we use to maintain the, the population for reintroduction. Don't do that. <clears throat> um, and uh, we oversee all her day-to-day -day operations, so it's been great uh, getting to look after her. We've been really excited about our role in this project, um, and you'll hear a lot more about that today. Thanks, Lynn. Right. Look forward to it. And uh, Angie Bruce with Wyoming Game and Fish. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by just saying thank you um, to all these experts that I have on the panel with me today. I'm very excited to hear more specifics about this cloning project. Um, and just a personal story for me. I My first exposure to black-footed ferrets was back in 94 when I was an intern with the Nature Conservancy and had the opportunity to do some spotlight survey up on the South Dakota Badlands. Now, unfortunately, I didn't see any of those green shiny eyes. Um, what it did do is open my eyes to work with endangered species. And so I'm very proud to be a part of this today to hear how far we've come in this short amount of time. The Wyoming Department um, of Game and Fish, our past work and our current work definitely demonstrates our commitment to the recovery and conservation of black-footed ferrets, not only in Wyoming, um, but in its entire recovery area. Um, as Lennox explained, Wyoming represents the home of this rediscovery of the species, and we're very proud and excited about that. Um, and also we have the first and the longest surviving reintroduction site. So for three decades, the department has worked very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, other state federal partners, private landowners, and other stakeholders to ensure that population of ferrets continue to succeed in the wild. Um, so we're very proud of this work and this partnership and look forward to continuing it. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. We're going to go now into some question and answers of our panelists. And I'm going to start with you, Ryan. Uh, how did your partnership with the Black Footed Ferret Program get started? You know, I'm happy to share that uh, little bit of history. I'm going to say it all goes back to 2012 when I got a call from Seth Willie. Seth Willie was one of the, I believe, one of the regional directors at the time. And he called me and said, you know, could the new tools of uh, genomics and 21st century biotech, could it actually help with the uh, challenges ahead of the black-footed ferret? And in 2014, Pete Gober, who I'm sure you all know well, um, decided to put together a team of people to start to address this question. And he hosted this meeting at the Black-Footed Ferret Center. You'll see Robin and others there, including our panelists, other panelists today, um, Oliver Ryder. And that was when we learned for the first time, I learned that there were actually frozen cells in the frozen zoo. And it was at this meeting, I believe I saw the passion and the dedication of literally dozens of people volunteering over decades working on the black-footed ferret. And I decided at Revive and Restore that we wanted to make a concerted effort to actually do everything we could to move the idea, the potential for cloning to go forward. And with that, Revive and Restore actually um, did the sequencing work with Oliver Ryder to determine that those cell lines were incredibly unique. And with that, we contracted with Viagen, and you're gonna hear more about this cast of characters, but here they are, because they were quite a significant number of people that made this happen. I believe Revive and Restore was somewhat of the catalyst 
to bring these characters all together um, that you're seeing here today. But it, it was a heavy lifting from all of us. Over the eight years, we secured a, um, a permit from US Fish and Wildlife Service, and we continue to partner in the next stages that you're gonna hear more about today. Over to you, Nathan. And what stage of the cloning program are you at now and what's coming next? Aha, okay. Well, I think you've all seen this. Am I sharing my screen? Nathan, am I on share screen? Not yet. Oh, I want to make sure you see that. I'm so sorry. There we go. Something's coming up. Okay. You got to all see this. Oh, no. There we go. There you go. All right. Because if all, if everyone in your audience hasn't seen this image of Elizabeth Ann that went viral, literally the first week of her announcement of her birth last December, more than 1.3 billion people in the world saw Elizabeth Ann. And I would say part of the stages that we're at is helping the public understand the value of cloning and the truth that cloning does not cause a lot of the problems that people think about commonly. So part of what we're trying to demonstrate is that cloning actually can result in healthy, viable, and as you hear from Robin Bortner, now black-footed ferret. So our next step with cloning, somebody else asked this already in the chat, is will there be more cloned ferrets? Well, first of all, we hope on your left-hand side of your screen that um, Elizabeth Ann, who was cloned from the cell line, you know, from Willa that we've just discussed, we hope that she'll be sexually active next year and that she could even produce her first litter. And that would be incredible. Getting her genes into more offspring. Um, we also help uh, hope that we can clone more, uh, clone more sisters of Will in a sense, um, genetically identical that could um, again help contribute uh, to sort of fast tracking, bringing in new genetic diversity. On your right hand screen is a challenge for us. One of those two cell lines that Dr. Oliver Ryder referred to um, could be a ninth founder, uh, Elizabeth Ann being now considered an eighth founder. That cell line of SB2, uh, as he was referred to, has some canine distemper particles in the cell culture. And that's because SB2 actually died of canine distemper. We're in the process of trying to remove um, those particles so that we could hopefully create um, healthy clones that could actually be one day um, mated with the Elizabeth Ann offsprings, because we know genetically these two individuals, even though they go way back to the early days of Matitsi, we know genetically they were not siblings. So they would be a great pair. Um, I think you, Nathan, I think, or, uh, I think there was one other question for me. Should I proceed or do you want me to stop share? No, you, that's a, that is the next question. What is the <laughs> ultimate goal? Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving me uh, that tee up. So I think the, the ultimate goal on all this is to increase this genetic diversity. So this is a complicated slide, but for those of you um, who are not used to seeing this, this is the level of unique uh, alleles, as is referred to, uh, unique genes that both that SB2 cell line that I just showed you with canine distemper is on the far left and Willa um, on in red on the right, how unique those that that genetic information is for those ferrets. Because if you look at all the ferrets, and there have been over ten thousand ferrets that have been um, bred over all these years, they all are in effect as close as siblings or cousins. And so the whole impact of what we're trying to do is increase and bring in that genetic variation. Um, I think the next step for us is also building upon this cloning is to help uh, bring in disease resistance. As many of you know, the ferrets today um, suffer from plague, which is ubiquitous across the American prairies. 
And so our goal is to help bring in what could be the equivalent of a genetic vaccine, an inheritable vaccine that would help these ferrets survive. So the stages of genetic rescue, the cloning, to the pregnancy, the care, the goal is always to get these black-footed ferrets back into the wild. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you. That's gave you great. Any any thoughts that are been put into looking at doing some of this work with prairie dogs in the sense that it's a food source for the ferrets, and they're, they're the ones that actually end up with the plague. Yeah, it's a very good question, and I I believe a rather contentious one. Um, in, in terms of how prairie dogs are viewed. Um, so um, it's, it's the kind of work that Revive and Restore would be happy to get involved in. I think the plague resistance is going to be a huge challenge. We're still raising funds to actually do this kind of uh, research. It's, um, you know, these, this is a new terrain. Um, as you, we have all seen with the COVID uh, virus that these MR, MRA been very fast coming into fruition. And um, there's a chance of doing something like that for wildlife, but nobody's ever done that before. So um, all in the stages, Dr. Baker. Sounds like exciting times, times ahead. Uh, Ollie, I'm gonna move to you if I can. And uh, I ask you, how, how does a black-footed ferret fit into the frozen zoo collection and what other species are you working with specifically now? Well, thank you. We work with um, a wide diversity of species. We're trying to amass a very large collection because this is going to be an important resource for the future. Um, species are dwindling in numbers, and if you, as you've seen, but, uh, genetic diversity uh, diminishes. So uh, as populations get smaller. So now we have a great opportunity. So we have um, over 1,100 species and subspecies uh, of, uh, of, of uh, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals um, in the frozen zoo in collaboration with Viagen Equine and Pets and Revive and Restore. Um, last year, a Pshavalsky's horse was cloned, which is a different species from domestic horse. It has a different chromosome number. It's the only true wild horse. Um, in both cases, cells banked in the frozen zoo could contribute in a special way to saving species over the long term by securing their genetic diversity so that it need not be lost. And I can take one of the questions in the chat from uh, Linne, I think, if I pronounced the name right. And um, the, the key here is that we're saving living material. And um, only, a, only a living cell can make an animal. So it's not possible to, um, to produce clones from museum skins. And so that's why it's so important to bank living material uh, right now. Um, uh, uh, there are many important uses for, for samples in museums, but um, uh, using them as a source of cloning is um, um, not feasible at this point. Um, thank you. I'm ready for the next. And what do you see as the best, the best use of all these banked materials going forward? Well, there are many uses we know of, and new ones are regularly being developed. It's an exciting time in the field of, of DNA science, in the field of genetics and genomics. We are beginning to be able to look back into the history of a species and have a better understanding of how uh, large were its populations. Uh, was there one big connected population um, of animals across its range, or were there isolated populations that were diverging and gaining new characteristics and adapting to new environmental conditions? Knowing about what we want to save helps us do a better job of it. But there will also be use, uses for the thousands of samples in the frozen zoo, our wildlife biodiversity bank, that we do not yet imagine for sure. 
When the frozen zoo was started, the technology to sequence DNA was not available. It seemed impossible to make an animal from a skin cell and to work with cells in the lab so that they could make uh, any type of cell in the body, even whole animals. It was too fantastic to say out loud. What's most exciting to me is that we know now that we have the means to keep species alive and prevent their extinction, even if their numbers are small and they are threatened with extinction. But there's a lot to do. This is just the beginning and there's so much more we need to learn to do the job well for many different species. Fascinating. And lastly, how do you decide what to save now for futures you can't predict? You know, well, this is an important question and we should talk about it. I mean, all of us, because the citizenry of of local regions, of nations, and indeed around the planet are gonna decide what nature is like in the future. For how we devote our efforts now will have great impacts on the future. We have to ask ourselves, what of nature do we value and want to have around us for us and those in the future? What will people in the future want? It's a hard question to answer and people are not very good at it. Technology surprises us, but I think one really good idea is to save cells and store living cells for the future. People will then have more options. There's never been a more important time than now to do this. Well, this is certainly a valuable, valuable thing for my viewpoint. And uh, Sean, we're going to throw some at you now, if you don't mind. And uh, can you explain a little bit more about the science behind the uh, ISCNT cloning? And why did you think it would be successful for black-footed ferrets and domestic ferrets? Sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Lennox. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Is that, that working? Yes, good. Okay, okay. a little bit about, uh, I guess a little bit more background about the cloning process itself um, and how it went with the black-footed ferret. Um, as Dr. Ryder explained, um, we started with the black-footed ferret uh, tissue sample uh, that the San Diego Zoo took. And so if you see up in the left, top left, you see the black-footed ferret uh, that we started with. And then we produced the cells, we as in a Dr. Ryder's group. Um, we then took a domestic ferret. And so we need oocytes or eggs to use for the cloning process. Uh, so we take a domestic ferret and we're able to collect oocytes from that domestic ferret. Um, you can see there's an unfertilized egg. that So we take those and we mature them to a state that's called a metaphase two state. Um, that would actually be a state at which they were just waiting for fertilization. Uh, we take an enucleation pipette, um, which is just basically a glass pipette. It's about 15 to 20 microns. And we actually aspirate out the DNA from the oocyte. So that egg or oocyte is now DNA devoid. Um, we then take the cells from Willa, the original, um, provided by San Diego Zoo, and we actually inserted those into the oocytes that were devoid of DNA. That cell now contains all the genetic material to make a new Willa. It's basically a blueprint for Willa. And so we take and then introduce that cell into what's called the paravalent space, which is just the space between the ooplasm, the actual oocyte, and the zona pellucida on the outside. We give it with an electrical pulse. And so it's called electrical, electrofusion. You get an electrical pulse. And actually what it does, is it kind of allows these membranes here to mesh and join, and it just dumps that DNA right into the ooplasm. Uh, we then give it a stimulus in it, which it to divide. And so basically um, it can be caused by electrical shock, can be caused by um, chemicals. Uh, that embryo then is put in the culture and is allowed to develop. It is then transferred into a domestic ferret. And so then that domestic ferret will then carry that embryo to full term. And so then all throughout gestation, and then, then domestic ferret gives rise to Elizabeth and the first black-footed ferret. Um, I have a few pictures here to just kind of break down a little bit better um, what you can see. Let's see if I can get over to that. Uh, what you actually see under the microscope. So top left is what we call a nucleation. And so that's actually the removal of the DNA from the oocyte. Um, if you see on the left side, it's, that's a metaphase two oocyte. Um, there is a polar body extruded. Um, that's half the DNA, so it's going through one reduction division at this point. Um, and so this would be an oocyte that would be awaiting fertilization in a, a normal female. 
um, then we would go in and we remove it. So here you can see in uh, basically top left of the, the next picks, there's two sites of DNA. This is under fluorescence. We actually do this under fluorescence so we can be assured that the DNA is removed. And so we take our pipette. And so you can see the glass pipette that I was talking about. We actually go into the L site. We actually aspirate back. And so it is just a mechanical means of pulling the DNA out. And so you can see the DNA actually being aspirated into the pipette. And then you see at the last, you see an oocyte site that's completely devoid of any DNA. And so that, that oocyte site is no longer carrying the domestic DNA. Uh, we then take cells. So basically we call it cell transfer or reconstruction at this point. Um, and so this would just be kind of what cells would look like plated down. Um, and so we actually trypsinize these, they get lifted from the bottom of the plate. So these would grow in what we call a monolayer. So they would grow across the bottom of the plate. Each one of these individual cells actually contains the blueprint for Willa or for Elizabeth Ann. And so basically we would take a trypsin, which is a enzymatic digestion and that would lift all these cells off the bottom. We would then take and put them into a drop and then we pick them up into our pipette. And so if you see off to the right bottom, you can see the pipette and that pipette is containing a cell. And so then we would mechanically go right through the zona. So this is the zone of the outer layer, and this is the oplasm. So this is really what's the, um, actually would carry all the life form. You know, basically it's the internal of the egg. This is more like a, a shell, if you would think of it on a chicken egg. Um, we would then take and actually put the cell into it. And then that's where we would fuse it. And that cell would then basically just dump its DNA into this oocyte. And now it carries the blueprint or all genetic material to drive forward and basically have a, identical Elizabeth Ann. Fascinating. What's the next step or goal in the clearing project? So the, the next step um, for, I guess, uh, Ryan hit on it um, fairly well. Um, kind of where we're at is, uh, like you mentioned, we're going to go on to some different um, animals, hopefully. So hopefully we can go into uh, some different genetics. So basically try to take and walk that genetic bottleneck out a little bit by doing some additional animals. Um, also, just improvement in the general procedure. Uh, with any new species that we try, you, you typically hit it, you get some animals on the ground, and then you go back and actually improve. And so uh, the same basic protocol that we would use for all species would be used for the black-footed ferret, but actually the improvements to actually take and optimize it, we need to go back and put a little bit more work into that and just basically optimize it so we can have better efficiencies. And what would it take to utilize only BFF material? And uh, so, are domestics going to be necessary? Um, it, it, it would take a, a lot of optimization. Right now with the domestics, we've actually gained a, a lot of um, benefits that I don't think we foresaw. And one of them is actually just their, their in, innate mothering ability and ability to handle the, the domestic has been a lot easier. Um, so it, it's going to take uh, some optimization. Like I said, we're just starting to, starting to break ground on some initial studies for improvements, uh, revive and restore, working on some funding projects so we can try to try to get that up and running. So like I said, get improvements with that, but it's going to take big improvements to um, go into that. But right now there is a lot of benefits um, offered from using the domestics uh, just because of their ease of access and their ease in handling. Excellent. Well, Robin, um, we're going to move over to your area. Were there any different whelping preparations protocols for Elizabeth Ann's whelping and post-care event? Good question, Lennox. So let me pull my screen up here. <clears throat> so we've got some visuals to look at. <clears throat> so uh, we've had a lot of practice, uh, me and the team here at the National Black Bug Ferret Conservation Center, um, of uh, raising uh, young Black Bug Ferret kids um, from birth to weaning and into adulthood. Um, but Elizabeth Ann turned out to be a very different um, and special case for us uh, when it comes to our usual day-to-day -day operations. Um, regular black-footed ferret mothers, um, being a wild species, are very independent and they do most of the work on their own with just a little bit of supportive help from us. And in fact, they um, become very offended if we try to interfere in their process too much. Um, they're very wild, even though they've been living with, here with us for a long time. Um, Elizabeth Ann's case was very different. As you guys have heard, we used domestic surrogates to bring her into this world. Um, so we set up things um, very different. Uh, here at the center, we have 180 breeding adults <clears throat> to look after uh, at any given time of the year. But the week that we were expecting um, Elizabeth Ann's birth, uh, all of the attention was on her. So um, we set up this camera system that you can see here. Um, this is one of the domestic surrogate mothers. 
um, in her nest here. We drove across the country to pick these guys up um, partway through their gestation at what we had determined was the um, safest time to transport them so as not to risk their pregnancies, but still have them here where we could care for them. <clears throat> um, uh, after Viagen had done all their careful work with the implantation of the embryos. <clears throat> And uh, so we watched them carefully on camera here. Um, over here, you can see myself and uh, our staff veterinarian, Dr. Della Garrell, um, was instrumental in the rest of our husbandry team in getting these guys on the ground. Um, ultrasounding one of our domestic surrogates who was due with clones. Um, it's not something you can do on a regular black-footed ferret. Um, you cannot pick up our regular BFFs uh, by hand. So again, this was new territory for us. But as Sean hinted at, it gave us an advantage because we were able to keep um, a much closer eye on the process than we normally would with a black footed ferret mother who would have been much more nervous about us being too close to her as she was ready for birth. Um, Elizabeth Ann was born via cesarean section, uh, which is also a first for us here at the center anyway. <clears throat> and um, we kept a very, very close eye on her too. We keep we keep careful watch of all of our black footed ferret kids as they grow, but we kept extra special eyes on <laughs> Elizabeth Ann. So here's another cam photo from our um, surveillance footage. You can see um, her black points show up nicely on the infrared, um, lying here in her nest with her domestic surrogate family. Um, she got lots of regular weighings. Um, again, she's starting to grow up to be a black-footed ferret, so uh, we can't just handle her on a scale. We have our little tub set up here to keep her still. Um, and lots of supplemental um, feeding and care. So uh, we will offer supplemental feed to our black-footed ferret litters when necessary. Again, mom usually does most of the work for us. Um, but Elizabeth Ann got uh, lots of extra uh, snacks and love to make sure that she was uh, developing and healthy. <clears throat> so it's definitely a, a switch in protocols for us, but we're happy to say that it worked out well. Is Elizabeth Ann developing like an average BFF now? She is, and that was something that we um, wanted to make sure we kept track of. Um, uh, that was the one big question of, um, you know, because of the process that was used to create her and her being the first Black-footed ferret clone, how would she grow and develop and do, especially being raised with her domestic surrogates? Um, here's a few pictures of her uh, growth chart. So when she was first born, um, before you can kind of see these little seal points coming in over here, over on her 12-day slide, um, she looked uh, very similar, almost indistinguishable from the uh, domestic uh, surrogate kits since Elizabeth Ann was born outside of the regular breeding cycle of black-footed ferrets. We had a surrogate litter of kits here that were her foster siblings um, uh, so that she had a family to grow up with um, the interactions and then also um, the stimulation for mother to lactate um, is very important. So it was important for her to have those foster siblings and at the time we had no other black-footed ferrets for her to be with. <clears throat> so by 12 days here, you can see she's already looking very distinctive. Um, as soon as her points started to come in, she was easy to keep apart. Before that, we had to um, be careful to track and mark her, so we did lose track of her with her siblings. Um, 18 days over here, you can see she's very different. Her black mask is starting to come in. This is her with her um, foster mother. <clears throat> and her black tip tail and her little dark feet are starting to become very obvious. And then as we're approaching a couple months old over here, you can see that she is growing up to be um, a healthy black-footed ferret. Um, and indeed, if you follow her weight gain and development as far as vocalizations, um, and uh, growing in her dentition and uh, other different development points, she follows right along with the regular um, onto genetic development of a black footed ferret. So we were very happy um, to see that. <clears throat> Another slide on this one. Let me see if this one will play for you guys, just so you can kind of see. <clears throat> this is her tussling with her. Uh, Domestic siblings. So as, uh, as soon as she got to this age, she became very feisty, very fast. And we had to do that. <clears throat> is, is her behavior a little more aggressive than the domestic ferret? She did start to develop slightly different behavior. She was actually very quiet until right about she hit this point as her eyes started to open. And um, then all of a sudden she became uh, I don't want to say aggressive, but much more energetic um, playing with her siblings. But as she grew, we noticed that she started to develop more behaviors innate to her species and surprisingly not picking up from her foster siblings. So um, when she was um, a little bit older than this, um, I'll go back when she was probably approaching this 54 day mark here, um, you would open up the nest box with her domestic siblings and all the domestic ferrets would sit there and look at you and maybe peek up at the top of the box and see what's going on. 
And Elizabeth Ann immediately shot up into the tunnel um, and wanted to be away from us. So as she started to get older and kind of become really aware of her surroundings, we very quickly saw her start to defer back to her more innate behaviors, which is hiding from humans, staying close into her tunnel and burrow system. She very quickly started to favor that tunnel as her favorite and safest place when all the domestics were just crawling out of the cave. Um, so it was really interesting to see that nature versus nurture kind of take over for her and also something that we were happy to know um, was happening, even though she had kind of that domestic influence. What do you think is the future of backfitted fairy cloning? So that's a good question, Lennox, and you've heard a lot of um, uh, of ideas from our the rest of our team already. Brian and uh, Sean have both touched on where the, the goals of the project are going, which would be to have more clones and some more additional founders and also to start looking into the disease resistance piece of this puzzle that we're really keen on. But as far as here at the center and our role on what um, the more immediate future looks like here, first, Elizabeth Ann is our, is our only surviving Black Cemetery clone. So we would love to make sure that we have some more of Willa um, um, so, so that we just have more assurances that we have these um, you know, genetics on the ground that we can use to incorporate into the population. Um, uh, as Brian hinted on earlier, trying to bring back Studbook 2 or other animals from the earlier days um, would greatly increase the benefit in breeding to be able to get genetically valuable animals um, uh, from Elizabeth Ann and um, uh, maintain that diversity uh, from the original population. Um, but here in the, in the more short term, we have to think about what will we do with Elizabeth Ann now that we have her. Um, so at the moment, she is a, a healthy and growing uh, black-footed ferret. We are hopeful that she will come into estrus this spring, this past spring when she was about six months old. She was too young and she did not cycle, which we expected. Um, so hopefully in the coming spring, that black-footed ferrets start to come into estrus here. Um, starting in late February and then into March, we are hopeful that she will come into an estrus cycle. And then we're faced with picking the best mate for her. Because she's so genetically different, um, almost any male in our population is actually a pretty good match for her. There are some that might get us a better benefit from others. But I think one of the really big questions we want to know is, can she breed and have kits of her own um, as a healthy female black-footed ferret should, should? So that's a big question that we have to answer. And we might also want to have some backup ideas um, just in case. Um, we have done artificial insemination procedures here at the center uh, with the help of our team at the Smithsonian. <clears throat> and uh, we might want to uh, have that in our back pocket um, so we could always uh, thaw out semen from the bank and get some really valuable animals there, but you run the risk that she might not get pregnant. So that's still a balance that we have to have discussions about, um, but we hope that Elizabeth Ann's future will be helping us keep these genetics around for, for future generations. <clears throat> That's fascinating. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. And uh, Angie, um, what has been Wyoming Game and Fish's role in this recovery? Great. Thanks, Dr. Baker. Um, well, from the beginning, as um, Dr. Baker introduced today about the discovery of this remaining population was in Wyoming. And when that occurred, um, a lot of our field staff, um, the department took that very seriously and really jumped in working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service to understand um, that new discovered population. Um, we started monitoring, we started working primarily on assisting the landowners with uh, disease management of those prairie dog complexes, um, anything we could do to help ensure success of that site. Um, and then um, the first captive um, Blackfooted Ferret facility was in Wyoming, um, and that was at the Seville Wildlife Research Center. And we were involved in that till we completely phased out about 2005. Um, from there, we really focused um, our attention on uh, management plans. So we um, implemented a Wyoming team called the Blackfooted Ferret Advisory Team. From here, they developed two management plans for two different reintroduction sites. Um, one of those being Shirley Basin, that is in Natrona Carbon in Albany County. And then of course, the second one where we've been talking about mostly today um, in Matitsi area. So those reintroduction sites um, are very complicated. They take a lot of staff time and work, um, both to build um, landowner support, identify areas, identify habitat, um, 
We are committed then to survey the population of the area. Um, we really work with Wyoming and the public to get buy-in. Um, and then the continuous land management, especially um, that aspect of disease management that I talked about. Um, so then once we um, had those two sites um, up and going, we took um, a more holistic approach in 2018, and we developed a statewide plan for Wyoming. Um, and this uh, plan was approved by our Game and Fish Commission, and it closely aligns with the Fish and Wildlife Service Recovery Plan. And it outlines the department's goals um, and objectives for moving recovery forward. Um, specifically, it gives different matrix um, and parameters to any future reintroduction sites as well. And how is your Wyoming uh, literature published doing? Well, this is a... Um, my answer here, I wish it was something different than what I'm going to say. Um, so we'll start with the Shirley Basin restoration area. Um, and as most folks know, we do an annual survey of the area to give us a population estimate. So we're not counting every ferret out there, um, but it's really a trend from year to year that we're looking for. Um, and currently we're right in the middle of that annual surveying. So the numbers I have mostly are from 2020. And so in the next week or two, we should have new numbers for 21. Um, overall, I would say that the Shirley Basin area um, is holding stable. It is down from its peak, but yet um, we feel since it it's been about 70% up since 2017 that we are seeing some good signs here. Last year, we saw 32 different individuals in the area and at least nine litters. We surveyed um, approximately 11,000 acres in a three week time period. Um, so pretty stable in Shirley Basin. The Matitsi reintroduction area is not in the same place. Um, we have been doing a very intense dusting and plague management over the last six years in the area. And as most of you know, that there was only a single ferret observed last year. Um, again, that doesn't mean there isn't more ferrets out there. That's what the survey, we surveyed approximately 4,100 acres last year. Um, I did talk to our field staff um, just a few days ago, and this year so far we have seen two ferrets and their work is not um, finished yet. They're still surveying this week and maybe next week. Um, so yeah, we definitely have concerns with the Matitsi reintroduction area and we'll continue to focus efforts there on the um, disease management. All right, very good. I know that Andy, Andy told me about the two we found. Apparently they were quite large and very active, but uh, it's disappointing that we haven't found um, more because we've reintroduced uh, over about three years, a fair number. Yeah. And uh, what do your future recovery efforts look like? Well, we will again, just continue our efforts on these two introduction sites. They are a priority for us. Um, they do take lots of staff time and resources. And so we'll continue our efforts there and making those a focus. And then we, our advisory team continues to meet annually to prioritize any future um, reintroduction sites and review the matrix to see if we um, are able to move forward with any of those. Um, but again, we'll continue to just focus on our partnerships and maintaining the habitat in the two sites for now. Very good. Thank you so much. We've um, got some questions that have come in from the uh, from people watching this, and I'll read some of those to you now. And this is open to anybody that wants to tackle it. But how can the public get involved in black-footed ferret conservation? Who wants to take a shot at that? Mm -hmm. Angie, you, you have to deal with the public a lot. Yeah, so I, I would say a couple of things. Um, we're continuously educating folks. I think that's extremely important. Um, you know, to understand how that balanced ecosystem is needed in order to have recovery out on the landscape. So the education efforts that the museums are doing, 
um, our staff. Um, anything that we can help teach um, folks in Wyoming and others about uh, black-footed ferrets is huge. Uh, the more people understand what the issues are, I think there'll be a better support in the future. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Let you know, John Emmerich is John Emmerich has done a lot of work with the Friends of the Black Ferry Ferris trying to get some federal funding. Obviously, uh, it's been difficult with the uh, COVID epidemic, pandemic, getting meetings set up and all with Congress. Uh, you had something, Robin, you want to say? Yeah, I was going to say another way um, uh, for public involvement is that our new partners that work on this program. Um, outreach to a lot of folks. Um, we are not the only center that breeds Blackfoot and Ferris. We have five breeding partners, uh, the Shine Mountain Zoo in the spring, Colorado Springs, the Louisville Zoo, the Phoenix Zoo, the Toronto Zoo, and then um, uh, the Smithsonian's National Zoo at their breeding center, um, the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute where they hold their breeding colonies. Um, in addition to that, we have a number um, of display facilities that just um, have post-reproductive animals on display for public outreach, and a lot of those are ambassador animals that are out there. Um, a lot of our breeding zoo partners are really involved in conservation, um, and it's a really great first step to reach out to the public. They run um, funding programs to help with the friends group and um, provide dollars for conservation out there, and also breed the ferrets that get out on the ground and are released. Um, so if you're near any of those institutions that have a black-footed ferret, go and visit them. Um, and if they have a, you know, a quarters for conservation program or a funding drive there, support them out. That's a great way for the public to learn about where black-footed ferret conservation is happening and how they can get involved. <clears throat> we have another question, maybe Ali and uh, Sean will tackle, but what are the chances that genetic diseases are displayed in Elizabeth Ann and future clones? We wouldn't expect the introduction of any new. Can you? As, as all right, uh, we wouldn't really expect the uh, introduction of any new diseases through the cloning process. But if a, an animal was carrying some type of genetic disease, the cloning process just replicates the original genetics. So if there is an issue with any animal, it would be propagated genetics, just like it would have been through breeding. I think to add to that, you know, the, the interesting point is that there's so much more genetic diversity in Elizabeth Ann. Um, she has a lot of, uh, a lot to add to the population. Um, and it's, uh, it's possible that there are uh, genetic mutations that she had, but the ferrets were a small population. And and that's where the studies of the DNA of genomic studies are helping to identify um, risks um, in in wild animal populations, you know, just as they just as they have been in in human populations. So, um, the the interesting thing though is that if there are any problems, you know, we can make more Elizabeth Anns. We can make any animal that we have cells from, you know. Uh, we can make we can make more of them. So it's not that she's going to appear once. You know, it's today is the, you know, this is the 40th anniversary of the rediscovery of black-footed ferrets, and it's remarkable that you know there's going to be a release of captive red black-footed ferrets, um, you know, in Matitsi and other places um, in the coming days, and other places in Wyoming in the coming days, and and. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, 40 years ago, I remember when they were rediscovered and how exciting it was to think that an endangered species that was thought to be gone was found. And I would go to scientific wildlife conferences and, and, and hear presentations where people would show pictures of the green eye shine that Angela Bruce uh, uh, mentioned that she wanted to see and her excitement about being involved in this um, is just a wonderful story. And we can just think too that 140 years from now, you know, um, we could release more Elizabeth Anns if we wanted to. Hopefully there'll be thriving populations, but we have an, a kind of an insurance policy now uh, with the technology that's been developed that is um, very special. Very good. Another question came in, uh, what are the implications of cloning for habitat conservation? 
Well, I'd like to take a shot at that one too. Um, people say, you know, like if we have cloning where people afraid to say that we're not going to be concerned about protecting habitat because we can bring a species back and species require habitat. We recognize that um, in a very emotional way, in, a, in an understanding, when you look at the landscape, you understand that the animals fit it. And we need to protect habitat to save species. Um, and that's where they, uh, that's where they evolved, that's where they came to be, that's where they belong. And this is an effort to, uh, like with cloning, is an effort to sustain that relationship with the habitat because humans have altered that relationship uh, by changing the habitat. And, and we can change it back. And, uh, uh, and this is an example of, of how that's possible. I'll, um, I can second some of that opinion if you want, Lennox. I think that the cloning program will hopefully create a need for more habitat conservation for ferrets and the associated species in the uh, prairie dog and plain ecosystem. Um, hopefully, our cloned ferrets will allow us to bring genetic diversity back that will help us create a more robust and healthy black footed ferret population. Um, and we'll have more healthy and disease resistant animals to get there out on the ground, which means that they'll need space to go. <clears throat> What is the average lifespan of a black-footed ferret? I can answer that one for you if you want, Lennox. Um, yeah. In the wild, uh, some of the original populations, especially out in the PC, um, were estimated to have uh, only a mean um, life expectancy of 0.9 years, meaning that many of them would need to reproduce their first year if they wanted to get a shot. Um, uh, these days, we've found um, three-year-olds with some frequency, so two to three years in the wild is pretty good for black ferret, mostly due to predation of life out there on the prairie. In captivity, or in our managed population here, where <clears throat> they are free from predation pressures, uh, we've seen animals reach ages from five to eight. <laughs> five to eight years. Very good. And uh, can cloning help with producing more resilient ferrets to diseases like distemper and plague? Um, I'd, I'd love yes. to chime in here, Dr. Baker. Um, right. I think one point that we haven't really fully made uh, to the audience here is that when a, a species like this has lost some genetic variation, as we saw in that chart, you know, they've over time, they've lost it through inbreeding. There's a, an assumption that by increasing their genetic diversity, you help the species itself become more resilient. It makes them healthier, more vibrant, more reproductively capable, and potentially even more capable of um, handling disease. Now, sylvatic plague uh, is obviously something that they are 100% uh, susceptible to. But interestingly enough, the domestic ferret does not get a plague. It does not have an impact on the domestic ferret health. So what is different about those ferrets that are so closely related, yet one gets disease and another one doesn't? And that's part of the study that we are doing at Revive and Restore, trying to understand the genetics of this as well as the antibody response. So I think once we better understand these relationships, through cloning, you can help introduce that genetic variation if needed. It would be exciting. Because we've uh, we've seen plague reintroduce on, on our ranch here. We've seen it. It's kind of a cyclic thing. When I first got the ranch in '99, we had tons of prairie dogs, and then within three or four years, a lot of the towns had completely died out. Yeah. And they came back in the in the mid 2000s, and then uh, and we're doing quite well in in 12 when we started doing the studies. Uh, Jesse and his group from the Fish and Wildlife, they. Uh, they, they did a study where they cordoned off four separate little sections and were giving vaccine and, and also placebo. And the, even though it was kept a secret which was which, they had a, a code. The people working out there could knew within the first year which ones were getting vaccine, which ones weren't. 
work. We just saw huge healthy populations in the two that were two areas that were getting vaccines. And that's a that in by 16, it was a very healthy group of prairie dogs. And that's when we made our first reintroduction out there. Clearly, plague has come back some in the last year or two. And that's why uh, Angela's report of how things are doing in Matisse is not quite quite as bright. Right. So it would be a huge help if you can if you could develop that. Another you know, the question's coming. Part. I was going to. I was just going to say, Dr. Baker. I think one of the hardest things here is that the plague isn't an invasive disease. It was brought in. It was introduced inadvertently, and yet the native fleas and uh, you know are are a vector. And I think that makes it a very complicated situation for how to remove plague from the environment seems impossible, and yet uh, it doesn't belong there in the American prairie for sure. Yep. It's going to be hard to get rid of because we still see in Wyoming occasional human cases. Plague yeah. itself obviously wiped out part of Europe, but the disease is not hard to treat nowadays. Tetracycline, some very common antibiotics will do it. Exactly. The problem is making the diagnosis and uh, getting a physician that will think of it because it, unless they have big no development, it kind of looks like a flu like illness. Right. And, uh, and we've had no one death in Wyoming in oh, a few years ago. How many ferrets are needed for a self-sustaining population? Who wants to take a shot at that one? Robin? Yeah, I can give that one a try. Um, you know, most of our self-sustaining release sites, I'm not sure if we have a, um, a pin on the exact number that's necessary, but larger is better. Um, so Shirley Basin has been going for a long, long time under its own steam. Um, they have several hundred thousands of acres out there. Um, another one is in South Dakota, not a Badlands <clears throat> National Park area. Um, so somewhere where you can get um, upwards to um, hopefully about 100 breeding adults, you're going to have a much better chance at having that self-sustaining population that's not going to rely on us trying to supplement it and keep it going. Um, but we've had some with slightly smaller ones. Um, uh, I think probably uh, down toward more about 50 animals, we've seen it happen, but it does um, rely on a little bit more management. So the larger that you can get those up into the hundreds, you have much better success. It's kind of a, a, a question that goes along with that. How large of a prairie dog colony is needed to support a ferret? Uh, we don't have any of our, our field personnel on the panel today, but I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I think for more, most of our larger um, sites where we hope to have a decent population get started, we're looking for about a minimum of 1,500 acres. Um, but a female black-footed ferret, depending on the density of prairie dogs on the habitat that she's living in, can defend 100 acres to herself. So that kind of gives you an idea of the amount of space that these little critters actually need. It's more than I think most people um, assume. Um, and then the males will have overlapping ranges across the females as they defend females for themselves from other males. Um, so you can see how that amount of space is going to add up. And if you are on not blacktails, which are a very dense species, if you're on whitetail or Gunnison's prairie dogs, which um, burrow differently, Matitsi is a whitetailed colony, <clears throat> um, they're more spread out. And so they're going to need more space because you have fewer prairie dogs per acre. So those guys might need even more space than that. Um, so you can see how that acreage um, is going to start to uh, creep up to maintain a healthy population. How much, how, how much, how many prairie dogs a ferret eat? What do they need? A ferret every how many days? They need to... I think we, I think we say a, a, a ferret will kill a prairie dog every two to three days. So we'd say about 250 prairie dogs will feed a ferret for you. <clears throat> well, I would think a lot of people don't want prairie dogs in their place. I would think that would be an incentive to have ferrets, uh, whether they keep down the population or not. They, uh, Prairie dogs can sure breed quickly. Uh, the right aside condition. from, uh, go ahead. The right conditions, yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah. Aside from uh, taming the plague and distemper risk, what efforts are on the way to reach adequate prey levels? In other words, who's preying on the prairie dogs? Anybody want to tackle that one or? It's getting a little away from I know in our area we worry about uh, eagles and coyotes are probably two of the main prey they got. 
I don't know of a, what other what other animals play on per, on ferrets. On on ferrets or prairie dogs? <clears throat> on ferrets. Oh, on ferrets. So um, uh, plenty of other critters out there on the prairie that can get a hold of a ferret will eat it. Coyotes and badgers um, can be predators of ferrets as well as owls. Um, hopefully not hawks as much since hopefully the ferrets are down during the um, day, but we've seen photos of eagles taking ferrets, whether they scavenged that animal or killed it themselves, we don't know. Um, but occasionally they will come above ground during the day, so that can that can happen. Do you have anything to add to that, Angie? <clears throat> We did that. Yeah, Robin, I think you hit that. And in Wyoming, we do have a very active um, predator control program um, for multiple reasons, not necessarily as ferrets as the primary reasons, but I'm, I'm thinking in particularly with coyote control. So there is other efforts going on. Right. And uh, this question I knew was bound to come up, but has there been any pushback uh, about doing the cloning of the black footed ferret? from, I'll say, our anti-scientific population. You know, I'll wade in on that, Dr. Baker, because um, Revive and Restore did secure um, the permit to do this work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and there was an open public comment period as part of that uh, process in the Federal Register. And uh, we have literally zero complaints about this project. I think partly because it has happened slowly over time, incrementally. There's been lots of opportunity for people to learn more about why we are doing this kind of work and why it will be so impactful. And we've been doing it with uh, transparency, um, as you can see from all of the materials and photographs and um, work that we've done to, to show the process. So um, we're really happy to say that uh, certainly at Revive and Restore, in my knowledge with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the cloning of Elizabeth Ann has met with huge success. And it's a tribute to um, all of this work that so many people have gone through. Thank you. That's good to hear. You all have obviously handled this well. And uh, one, one of the little minor questions they put in, does a black-footed ferret eat, eat anything but prairie dogs? Take that one if you like. Uh, I can answer. But I can answer yeah. part of that because I saw saw one on a raccoon. Once. That, that was an unusual circumstance. That is a pretty exceptional case, Lennox, but it shows you that if they need to, they will prey switch. So um, our general understanding is that about 90% of their diet is comprised of prairie dogs. So they're pretty dependent on a healthy prairie dog colony for survival. But they can will prey switch if they need to. Um, so uh, other smaller rodents, um, mice, and other ground squirrels and things probably make up the better part of the rest of that. I can't imagine a ferret would turn down a, a cottontail in front of its nose if it was hungry, but I don't know that I've seen it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this question came in, I think, for me, but can you speak about your experience with reintroduction efforts, especially how it impacts cattle production? And I would have to say, not at all. We uh, we have the cattle up in the area where they were introduced uh, for short times during the year. Uh, and we have some larkspur up there, so we don't keep them up there until sometime about this time of year, we may have some cattle up there. But we, uh, I don't think it affects uh, ranching at all. And uh, nor do the prairie dogs. We do have white tails, you point out. The colonies tend to be a little more dispersed, and you can recognize them easily because they clean off the grass around the colony, but they don't eat up much of the prairie grass at all. So we don't have any trouble with having adequate uh, forage for, our, for not only for our cattle, but also the elk and deer and antelope all up there. They all seem to get along pretty well together. So I think some of this fear of ranchers worrying about prairie dogs and ferrets interfering with the cattle, I think that's more of uh, you know, hist historical thing, attitudes that were developed. Because you know, in the I guess it was in the late 1800s and all, there was some massive slaughter and poisoning of prairie dogs, unfortunately. But unfortunately, prairie dogs are hard to eradicate, and they come back pretty, pretty good. Plague has been probably the, the worst eradicator of, uh, of prairie dogs. But I, for those ranchers out there listening to this, I would not be at all hesitant to 
have this kind of project on your ranch. And I've got to meet a lot of interesting people through all this and have been involved with John Emmerich and the, some of the funding. And uh, I think it's, a, it's added just another interesting aspect to ranch life. Dr. Uh, Baker. One more question came in. Yes. Dr. Baker, I was just going to say, I'm so happy to hear you articulate all of that, of your actual experience on the ground um, as a rancher. Um, I wish more people understood um, that dynamic and, and how healthy it can be for a ranch owner with cattle. Well, I've had no, no adversity. And I had, I had some, obviously, John Hogg is a neighbor. I mean, Alan, Alan Hogg, John's son. And he has no concerns about either. I've uh, been a good neighbor. I've got several other neighbors that didn't want to, you know, have this project on their ranch, but they knew that I'd warned them that, you know, some of these prairie dogs and ferrets are going to get over on your property, and they weren't overly concerned with it. The Hoodoo Ranch in the 91. So I'm sure there's some colonies probably over there. So at least all my connecting neighbors uh, don't seem to have any great fear of this either. But there are some, are some, some people in the area that did express some reservations about it. And I think it's just gonna take time for them to realize that if these go well with the neighbors, they'll probably get involved with it too. One of the questions came in, if the cloned ferrets can help introduce resistance to plague and distemper, are those clones from the original population and why are ferrets endangered? You follow that one. That's a little bit harder to understand what they're saying, I think. Um, yeah, I think I can start in on that one if you want. Lennox, uh, maybe um, so anyone else yeah. welcome to chime in. <clears throat> um, because black footed ferrets evolved on the North American continent without plague or distemper, um, even cloning these animals is not likely to bring an innate resistance back for it. They just, this species has never had the opportunity to have any resistance to these diseases, which is why they are so susceptible. Um, the cloning project, however, will bring more diversity, more heterozygosity in their genetic makeup that hopefully will make their immune systems more robust and could allow them to respond better to these. But that being said, this is still a non-native disease that these animals have not had a chance to evolve with. And so plague is distemper, um, until we move on to um, our engineered disease resistance phase are likely to still be an issue. Um, the original reason that black-footed ferrets um, uh, were uh, assumed is extinct, thankfully erroneously, um, but because they began to decline um, uh, was one, these non-native diseases, and um, two, uh, the westward expansion of humans into the western United States. So um, conversion and fragmentation of their native habitat into agriculture and development. And so just loss of prairie dog habitat that supports the ferrets. <clears throat> Anyone else Thank have you. anything to add? <clears throat> this may be our last question, but this may be coming to Sean and I a little more, but how many attempts were made to create Elizabeth Ann and what contribute, contributed to any failures? So Elizabeth Ann was actually made during our protocol development. And so it actually happened much quicker and easier than we had expected. Um, and so the, it, it, most of it is just learning about the species. We, we haven't had, that is internally, a lot of exposures to ferrets. That was actually a new species for us to pick up and go with. And so uh, the majority of the, the ups and downs and learning has been attributed to learning the ferret, basically physiology, um, basic background about embryology on the ferrets. Um, and so right now, like I said, we are in our current optimization period right now. So we got the success. And so now the point forward is to actually optimize and improve. Very good. Oh, you have anything to add to all that? I think he's muted. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I think that, uh, I think that Sean Walker is the right person to answer that question. All right, very good. Well, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, work. We've been almost an hour and a half into this, and I think it's uh, a lot of a lot of information has been departed, and a lot of questions answered. It's been a it's been a uh, uh, fascinating uh, conversation, and uh, and just um, 
in wrapping up. In wrapping up, I'd, uh, I'd like each of you to make a closing statement, if you don't mind, a uh, minute or so. Uh, Ali, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, I'd like to thank again the, you know, the, the Draper Museum and, and you, Dr. Baker, um, for giving us a chance to um, you know, meet virtually with, with people in Matizzi and answer the questions. It was really, really interesting. And um, uh, it's a long way from the frozen zoo to the prairie, to the wild country of Wyoming. And it's just makes me appreciative of what we can do when we work together and, and, and recognize how many common goals we have uh, to um, celebrate nature and uh, preserve it. Thank you. And uh, Ryan? Um, I'd like to echo uh, Oliver Ryder's appreciation of the Desert Museum and all the folks who've been participating and listening in today with great questions. Um, I should say that I think this is an incredible story about hope. It's about hope, it's about insight, it's about inspiration. When we think about 40 years ago, that the public and the world thought that, these, that the species was actually exterminated, that it was extinct. Um, this is a story of resilience, and it's a story of intended consequences. We always hear about the unintended consequences of people intervening in nature and bad things happening, hunting uh, and habitat loss. And, and this is a story of people with intent to preserve old cell lines, to engineer new solutions. Biogen has been doing cloning with dozens of species now successfully. It's a story about the use of these tools and it's a story about the reintroduction to the wild of the species. And, and I, I think it's a model for what we can do with many other endangered and threatened species. So um, I say congratulations to everyone. It certainly is a good, good closing message. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, Sean, any comments? Uh, yeah, and basically, I, I want to thank everybody who uh, made this webinar possible also and pretty much go along with Ollie and also Ryan. Um, you know, this has been such a unique experience for our company. Um, we are so uh, happy to be part of this unique experience and to see what can happen when uh, very diverse groups come together with a common goal and understand their strengths and understand how to use them together and use them for the betterment of society and also the betterment of um, conservation. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, like I said, if you look at this diverse group and how it was put together and basically the contributions they made, not only just recently, but throughout the years, it's, it's an amazing thing to be part of and probably one of the biggest things I've been part of in my career. So like I said, I thank everybody for allowing us to be part of that. It's been a great experience. Thank you so much. Robin? Thanks, Lennox. Um, yeah, this has just been such a, such a groundbreaking and amazing project to be a part of. You know, the service is tasked with the regulation and guardianship of this species for the long term as an endangered species in the United States. But thankfully, we also get to be a part of um, the on the ground conservation work and uh, being able to bring together all the partners that you see on this panel and all the ones that you don't. We have a long list of partnerships that make um, any of the fair program possible. We could never do it by ourselves. Um, so everyone from the cloning to the field and everything in between and all of our zoo breeding partners, um, uh, all of that is what really makes fair conservation possible. Um, no one of us could have ever done it alone. So being able to be a part of this enormous conservation family is amazing. Um, we're really excited to see, um, obviously, how Elizabeth Ann continues to develop and where this project is going to go in the future. And I think it's going to be really exciting. <clears throat> and Angela? Yeah, so I'll keep, clean up here. yeah, I'll keep my comments pretty brief because I loved everything I just heard um, between all the partners and everybody having their role between the innovative approaches that Ryan was speaking of, um, all of it coming together. And I think 
this is just the momentum is there. We need to continue it and continue to build off of it so we can have these spirits a native part of the landscape. And so that I'm not giving you numbers like I did today, that I'm giving you recovery numbers instead. So thanks to everyone. It was great being a part of the panel. Thanks, Bill. I, um, I have a few comments to make just to close. I, uh, I spent 40 years as a heart surgeon and during a great 40 years from the uh, late 60s till I retired in 2010. And I saw a tremendous amount of advances in heart surgery. And I don't think I've ever been to a presentation that's as exciting as what you all have presented the last hour and a half. This has really taken a lot of the science that was all developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And uh, I remember hearing some lectures in medical school in the, in the 60s about the feature of DNA transfers, RNA transferase, and well, they're all theories. Nothing was done. And then in 2001, I was visiting my daughter in college as a freshman in Paris Day. And I went to her first year biology class. And I heard almost the same lectures I'd heard in the 60s, but they were all in the past. And all these things had been done. And you all have obviously, or people have now have taken all these advancements and gone further with it. And, uh, and gosh, what the future holds for a lot of this is hard to imagine, but it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm 80 now, and I'm, I wish I had 50 more years ahead of me, because I'd like to just see what all does happen. It makes it very exciting to look back at where we were and where people like you have now brought us, brought us to. There are some people that are not here today that I think deserve special mention. Uh, Pete Gobar has been a kind of leader of the, all of this, putting this together, along with Kimberly Frazier. And Kimberly is here, so she can sneak in and take a look there. But Kimberly's here. Well, you can hear Kim. She's here. And, uh, but also Della Gorel, you've heard mentioned some here. Uh, and she's, I've had the pleasure of visiting Robin and Della and all that at the center. And it is a, it is a fabulous uh, place to visit. Uh, you wish more public could get to it, but it has to be kept a certain amount of confidentiality to it. And, uh, so it's not heavily toured, but it is a it is an alternate experience. We've taken some kids down there over time. My daughter loves going by there, and uh, it's a fun place to visit. But to think about this, uh, this center represents about 40 years of work and over 50 different partners, and that's a phenomenal thing to put together. All y'all are, are partners in this thing, and there are lots of other people that we haven't mentioned today that have been partners with this. All the game and fish outfits in the States and the, the uh, different scientists have been involved with this. It's a huge effort, but it's been, it's great to see it start to come to the fruition it has been. And I think the next five to 10 years are gonna be even more exciting. And not just with black-footed ferrets, but I think we're gonna hear about other species that John and uh, Ryan are working with over time. And I will keep, keep freezing all this stuff. It's been a very valuable. I think uh, you had kind of partnered with uh, Dr. Thorne back in the, in the, in the I guess in the eighties uh, about doing this and freezing it. And it's, uh, it was a great phone call you two had because that really has resulted in having all this tissue available. And, uh, and I just wish best of luck to all of you in future experience with this and also with other species that you're working with because it really is the forefront and as Wayne pointed out, it's, a, it's something we're doing very constructive. There's nothing dangerous or destructive about this. And uh, so thanks again to everybody involved. And uh, I look forward to having all of you here in Matitsi next year on the, in the prime year of 41. And, uh, and it'll be a, a good, good look. And I suspect we're gonna hear some more new information the way things are going. And thank you again. <laughs>